Welcome to All Access. I'm Christina McLean. And I'm Lauren Huberman. Today's episode is about celebrating representation of people with disabilities in the arts. The We Are Proud mural was created by Sam Kirk to celebrate and acknowledge the lived experiences of residents from Chicago's disabled and senior communities through visual representations, color palettes, and tactile surfaces that encourage interaction with the mural. Individuals with disabilities of different ages and races are depicted throughout the mural in recreational settings, as well as in professions that are commonly underrepresented in the disability community, such as doctors, teachers, and information technology. In developing this artwork, Sam Kirk worked with poet Lily Diego Johnson, whose poem is featured as part of the mural, with a host of community members organized by the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities and with representation from the Department of Family and Support Services, which inspired the final artwork. Today, we talk to artist Sam Kirk and poet Lily Diego Johnson about their work on the We Are Proud mural at Central West Community Center. And we also discuss the ways they celebrate and represent disability in the arts. Sam Kirk is a Chicago-based multidisciplinary artist who explores culture and identity politics. Her artwork focuses on a variety of intersections, which encompass a call to celebrate differences and enact change. Vivid and powerful images of women, members of the LGBTQIA community, and those who have historically been excluded are celebrated in narratives that share the journeys that have made them who they are. Kirk's public murals often address social issues as she intentionally uses the public space to spark dialogue around topics of equality and visibility. Kirk has exhibited extensively at venues including museums and galleries across the U.S. Her public artwork has been commissioned nationally and internationally to recognize cultural achievements, acknowledgments of progress, and to share the stories of our communities. Welcome, Sam. Hello, thank you. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Glad to have you here today. So I think in order for us to um, get a better picture of who you are as an artist, we really wanted to go back and learn a little bit about how you got interested in art Mm -hmm. and um, how your journey as an artist started. Yeah, for sure. So I was I was definitely that kid, you know, that was drawing on my homework and drawing in class. So art has always been an interest of mine. It was, it's always been something that has fascinated me. But art really cemented itself in my life um, as a teenager. I came out when I was 15, and I didn't know how to talk about that. And so art was a way for me to process what I was thinking, what I was feeling. And I essentially had like a visual journal where I would draw all of these different versions of myself as I, you know, kind of navigated my identity and learned what it meant to be queer. Um, I grew up on the South Side and no one talked about the LGBTQ community. And so it was a new vocabulary for me and something that I didn't have any like visual reference to. And so art was that space for me. It was a space for me to navigate what this meant for me as an individual. Mm -hmm. Did you share your artwork at that time? Like, did you share it with your family or your friends? Or was it more just for you, like you said, to process? Yeah, I didn't really share it with my family as much, at at least not the journal. Um, I did share my other work, paintings and and other drawings. And um, it got me into some trouble, you know, processing some of these deep emotions puts a lot out there. How would you say that your identity has shaped some of the art you've done? I grew up here in Chicago. I'm a kid that's from generations of Chicagoans. Both of my parents were born and raised here as well. I grew up in a mixed family. My mother's Afro-Latina, my father's of European descent. And so growing up here, aside from being queer, I was also a biracial kid living in neighborhoods that had a majority as far as culture goes. My identity culturally within different communities plays a big part in my art. And growing up, we moved around a lot for a combination of reasons. Some because my parents were working, you know, class and we moved when, you know, they got promotions or raises Mm -hmm. and we could get a better place. And also 
moved because there was challenges just with our family, like who we were. And that made me really interested in culture overall. I wanted to understand like why people felt I had to select just one ethnicity that I was. Like why did my friends feel like I had to pick, you know, the one thing that they were and mm-hmm. couldn't be all of these things. And so it led me to really explore Chicago in a different way and to get outside of my neighborhood as much as I could and learn about the other cultures that were here. I mean, that's the foundation of my work mm-hmm. today. Um, it's yeah. really telling you know, the stories of our communities, of our neighborhoods uh, here and in other states, other countries as well. Well, I know we really want to talk to you about the We Are Proud mural, but would also like to just hear about some of the other projects that you've done around Chicago, around the world. I'm getting close to 70 public art installations and murals um, internationally. Chicago definitely has majority. I'd say probably a good 75% of them are here. It's just fantastic. I just love to (laughs) travel and paint. (laughs) We are really looking forward to talking to you about the process that you went through to, you know, get ideas or brainstorm with the disability community um, about the We Are Proud mural. We know that it was a collaboration between the Department of Uh, cultural fairs and special events, family of support services, and of course, mayor's office for people with disabilities, but would just love to learn about any research you did to help you be more prepared for the project or Mm -hmm. just ways the disability community played a role and and senior citizens played a role in creating this beautiful piece of art. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much research. (laughs) (laughs) And I couldn't have completed this mural if the community didn't come forth in the way that they did like we had so many conversations because it's important to me that especially in public art that the work that you put out there represents people correctly I had included folks from within the disabled community in my work before but this was the first time that anyone had told me you can be doing this better or you should consider this like I appreciated Mm -hmm. how direct feedback that they gave. And so I learned a lot directly from the community, but then also did additional research um, on my own just to understand, like, how could this mural, if it's mostly going to be two dimensional, how could this mural come to life more so that the entire community can interact with it? And so that's when we started to look at like textures so that it can be touched and just thinking about like, how do those textures represent? you know, the actual work that's on the mural, but then also color palette. I love colors. I always paint in super vibrant colors, but this forced me to think about color palette much differently um, based on like how other people see color, don't see certain colors, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of research. I felt like I probably could have spent a whole year doing more (laughs) research, Um, but the timeline was that summer, and so I was just trying to read up as much as I can, listen to other podcasts and, mm-hmm. and things. Thankfully, we had several conversations with uh, community members, and then Commissioner Arfa's team was amazing. It just made an impact on me mm-hmm. in a different way, where I can't not think about how, as an artist who's you know interested in communication and telling stories, how much of my work is missing this community because I didn't think to put captions on my website or I didn't think to, you know, include different things. And so now it's just something that's always in my mind as we're moving forward. Even with like the plaque that we made, we Mm -hmm. also made it in Braille. And I'm like, why weren't we doing this for all of our mural Mm -hmm. projects? Like, why don't we do this all the time? Yeah, it's something that I'm planning to continue. Yeah, and the We Are Proud mural, it's so beautiful. It's at Damon and Ogden, and it's really made our building so attractive, and people have definitely taken notice. And it's really neat because we'll see people stopping on the sidewalk to look at the mural and to, you know, read the poetry as well and just kind of take it in. I think also it's so neat because... There are depictions of people with disabilities just kind of in everyday lives, like dancing and hanging out with each other and playing soccer. And then there are um, people with disabilities depicted in different kinds of professions. It's just very vibrant and it's inclusive and it has this feeling of like celebration. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, that's that's what the goal was. And, you know, so much of that content came directly from the community. 
There's a poem that's also incorporated in your mural, and yes. we will get a chance to talk to um, Lily later. Did you and Lily work together at all, or did you collaborate at all on the mural? We did. You know, in the process of, of putting together the mural, I had actually asked the community if they had any creative writers or anyone that they knew that I could work with, because while the visuals, um, I think, are important, I felt like just from the research and from the conversations we were having, including text, was also important as well. And I wanted it to come from someone within the community. Lily was recommended. And so we spoke and I, you know, told her about the project. I shared all of the uh, conversations we had with the community so she could listen to them. Walked her through the direction I was planning to take. And then she selected a few different poems that she thought would work Mm -hmm. and together we went through we couldn't include like the entire piece but we went through which pieces would be a good fit for the mural Mm -hmm. to help folks just like get a good sense of what this piece is about Mm -hmm. and what it's meant to represent and I thought it was perfect Mm -hmm. this is a perfect fit we chose to kind of bookend the mural with it so that no matter which way people come to see the piece they read her words almost first, you know, as an introduction to the piece. Mm -hmm. Something that Christina and I um, were reading about before the podcast is um, people with disabilities represented in art. And so how rare that is in movies, um, in murals, like the ones that you produced in lots of different ways. And I think the common perception is that people think that it's unusual for someone to have a disability. And obviously that's not the case at all. And there's just such an underrepresentation, you know, in Hollywood in so many different ways. Do you think that your work, you'll continue to represent people with disabilities or those who are underrepresented in other ways? Is that something that you'll continue? Absolutely. Um, I mean, when this project came, I was excited because there was a, a focus on the community entirely, right? Mm -hmm. Prior to this, I have always been focused on inclusivity. And so that's also including like different body types. And it's not just, you know, cultural related, but it's definitely something I'll continue to include. As I said before, it's like, I can't not think about it. Anytime I'm producing a concept, I find myself looking at the work and saying, I'm missing people, like I'm missing you know, folks, and then I'll start to change it or Mm -hmm. tweak it. So I think as we wrap up, what advice would you have for people um, tuning in today who are interested in art? I'd say try as much as possible to to figure out what your own lane is in it. I think there's a lot of rules in the art world. And if you get caught up in those rules, I don't think you'll have as much fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's an opportunity to you know, create a career that is truly unique to you and like how you want it to operate. And I think paving your own path for what that is as a creative entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. We don't think of artists as creative entrepreneurs enough, but that's what we are. Great. Well, I hope also that our listeners will come and check out the We Are Proud mural at Central West. It's at 2102 West Ogden. Um, You cannot miss it. And it's really beautiful and vibrant. And we're so pleased to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for so joining much. us. <laughs> Thank you, sure. Sam. Thank you. So now we're going to continue our conversation with Lily Diego Johnson, who wrote the poem that is incorporated in the We Are Proud mural at Central West. Lily Diego Johnson is a disabled, cisgender, immigrant woman from Chicago's southwest side. She is a licensed social worker in Illinois and currently provides mental health counseling through a disability-affirming lens. She is guided by the vision of disability justice in her personal and professional life. She uses her poetry and personal reflections to emphasize the tensions, issues, strengths, and joy in her communities. Her writing is a form of advocacy for social change. Welcome, Lily. Hi, thank you for having me. (laughs) Hi, yes, we are happy that you're here. And we are looking forward to the conversation um, about your work, both at the Central West 
Community Center with the Mural Project, as well as the other work that you've done in Chicago. So to get us started, can you talk to us a little bit about how you started writing poetry or writing in general? Yeah, so I've been writing, English is my second language, so I really started writing as a form of practice in terms of my um, English skills, but then I started writing in terms of to share what I was feeling for myself. Um, I did not have access to any kind of therapy or mental health services, but even as a child, I knew I needed some sort of support, but we didn't have the resources for it. So often writing was my form of therapy um, and kind of trying to find a way to express how I felt. And then it wasn't until um, high school where I actually started doing community service by reading a lot of my poetry in a lot of community events. And that was really fun. And after that, it just sort of took off. And I started doing a lot of performances in the Chicagoland area based upon request. And that's still kind of what I do. Yeah, I know that Lauren mentioned in your bio that you're a social worker. Do you encourage any of the people that you counsel or you work with to write poetry? Yeah, I I actually do. Um, but it's really based upon what they want. Like a lot mm-hmm. of people hate doing um, any kind of logging or journaling, but mm-hmm. a lot of people love it. Mm-hmm. So I'm always down for any creative kind of practices that they bring. Yeah, that's great. Lily, you're from Chicago? So I was born in Mexico, but Mm -hmm. I was raised in Chicago, yeah, from Mm -hmm. the southwest side. What kinds of things did you feel like you needed or wanted to write about to express yourself? Like from a young age, what kinds of things did you feel like you struggled with or Mm -hmm. really needed an outlet for? Yeah, so I really, um, I was always pretty attached to my mother, and sometimes I think it was a form of, like, separation anxiety, Um, not diagnosing myself, but Mm -hmm. it really was pretty intense. So I wrote a lot about that. I wrote a lot about what my mom meant to me. Um, I also wrote a lot of the struggles learning to speak. Um, I was a very, very quiet child to the point where it was hard for me actually to communicate even like I want some water or something like that. So just really it came down to me being able to express any kind of feeling I was experiencing. Like what themes are reflected in your poetry? Yeah, so I'm very driven by social justice. Like my poetry deals a lot with disability experience, chronic illness, immigration. Also, I've done a lot of work around violence um, around our city. It just really depends on, one, well, if I get asked to um, join a certain conversation or performance, but also um, just kind of what strikes me um, in the moment, what kind of feels like, yeah, I need to share something. And Sam talked a little bit about the process that you and her worked through uh, to include your poetry in the mural. I just would love to hear about your experience with that. Had mm-hmm. you written poetry that had been shared like that before? No, this was my first time that I had written for an actual mural. So what happened was Sam explained to me a little bit of the project and how through the community meetings, Sam was able to get some idea around like who was doing disability writing. My name came up, so I thought that was really awesome. Yeah. Um, I feel really good about that and just really honored. And so then when I spoke with Sam about it, um, Sam described what the mural was going to be containing. And then there was a point where Sam shared a little bit about the way that it was described. And so then from there, I sort of figured what the themes were. And then I kind of started putting lines together and it just sort of flowed out of me. Um, That's the best way Mm -hmm. I can describe it. Okay, so you wrote the poem specifically for the mural as the mural was being developed? Yeah, that's correct. It actually comes from two poems, um, but one poem, there were more excerpts taken from it than the other poem. She did say how you couldn't use the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But it kind of bookends the mural. That's amazing for you to see your words on Mm -hmm. such a big display at Central West. Yeah, I never um, had experienced that before. That was really new. Not only did I find it like just an honor, but also my family was really, really excited about it to the point where I was like, all right, you all chill. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, it can get a little much with them, but I, I think it's great. I really do. And just to be able to work with Sam and just for the community, that makes me feel really good. 
Do you have a favorite part of the poem? I think I think a lot about the the part that was used for my other poem because it was actually a, a reflection of someone I had lost who passed away. There's a, a big tension in disability community around cure and like whether mm-hmm. people should or should not seek it and what that kind of is like. And so the person that I had lost, I would consider them part of disability community, but I don't know that they would. That was kind of the reflection that I was thinking through. And so it really is that kind of little part that was taken from the other <laughs> from yeah. the other poem. Lily, would you be able to share some or all of the poem with us? Yes, yeah, so I can definitely do that. The poem um, is called Disability Pride, and this is the one where most of the excerpts are taken from, so I, I can read that. I taste disability pride when it burgeons from my stomach, through my throat, on my tongue, as I cheer and clap, listening to audio descriptions of disabled dancers comfortable in their bodies, expressing the pleasures of their stories and existing intimacy with their mobility devices. Weep as my friend uses her voice to share my own racing thoughts and growing questions of what it means to be disabled. I see disability pride in the way we move to create access for different body minds, not just to be included, but to show we're already here, access this imperfect, messy art that we hone with our collective disability wisdom. I touch disability pride in the hand of my disabled love as we move through a world that does not often expect us. We are queer, we are black, indigenous, disabled people of color, groping for each other to hold on to our cultures, traditions, our humanity, exhausted yet existing because we know in our core we belong. I smell disability pride in the way we strive for fragrance-free, breathing in the ableism we fight to unlearn, inhaling dreams, exhaling hopes for our disabled futures. I hear disability pride in the moments we gather, the stories we tell, the way we communicate with words without to build community, activism, advocacy. I follow disability pride into my aching bones, into the online connections that help me survive, into the sticky points of my experiences, and the moments disability pride does not apply to parts of our communities, when we do not feel it in ourselves, or when we search for it in the spirals of grief and loss, we have come to know the intricacies of disability pride. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Mm That is so powerful. It is. Lily, a lot of the themes, at least, that I picked out are around community and connection, obviously pride as well. Do you feel like you're a part of the disability community? Do you feel very connected to a group of other people with disabilities or other artists with disabilities in the city? Yeah, I do, actually. I would say that it took me a while to feel that way. There's a lot of complexities around disability community that I'm not sure I have the time to get into, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) I often get afraid because the way that I came into disability community was through my access to higher education. And so I think about a lot of disabled people who don't have that opportunity. I think about, well, that could have been me because at some point I was undocumented and I didn't know if I was going to go to college or not. Disability community to me is really kind of a point that I very much cherish and also kind of think about like, well, I wonder who else is not here. And while I do feel very involved and very much a part of it, I also know that like because I have higher education, um, I have accessed it, I have gone through it, I also know that people are more likely to listen to me versus someone who didn't get there. And so that feels a little scary. And at the same time, like, okay, well, where does my advocacy lie then? And that pride as someone, you know, with a disability, is that something that you always felt? Or is that something that you had to kind of grow into? No, very much growing into, even though I have a very apparent disability with like my blindness, um, I very much still try to pass and like try to act like uh, I'm not as quote unquote disabled, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still quote unquote normal and I do all the normal things, so to speak. And just like the ways that I kind of repressed a lot of myself to try to fit in with the 
conventional understandings of what it means to be non-disabled. And then even when I started identifying more with disability, it became kind of like, oh, I didn't realize that my mental health sort of would have already um, indicated that I was disabled. Um, And so then chronic pain and all these things. So it was a whole learning experience either way it went. It's kind of been a road that (laughs) I have gone through over and over. Yeah. And I think that's important, too. It's not something that even once you, you know, identify as someone with a disability, that doesn't mean that journey kind of stops. You know, it continues, you know, as someone with a disability, I could uh, attest to that, that Mm -hmm. there's little things that might happen, you know, every day that you kind of have a little gut check or a reminder. But I guess, you know, it's great to see how you are able to share that experience in your poetry. Thank you. Can you tell us about any of your other pieces or your other work? Something that I've been thinking about, it's really hard for me to write when I feel joy. Like, that's not something that I feel good about. Like, I actually want to write when I do feel joy. And so I've been trying to experiment with that, what that Mm. feels like. So what would you encourage other people to do who are interested in writing poetry or need some kind of creative outlet to express themselves? How would you suggest someone get started? Yeah, so whatever the creative outlet that you feel drawn to, just start. Particularly, I felt this in college and a little bit in high school where it's like, well, you're not Emily Dickinson or, you know, Mm -hmm. all of that. And I loved Emily Dickinson. Like, I thought she was great. And they're like, you're right, I'll never be that. But I developed my own style. And I developed it through, like, reading other great authors. But I never wanted to emulate them. Um, I wanted my work to be accessible to the community. um, And often the work that is considered, you know, the literary canon is often not super accessible to a lot of my communities. So I would say, like, if you're writing for yourself, or if you're drawing or, or whatever the art is, that's great, like have it be what it is. And then with time, you will start to develop your own creative ways and your own style to do what you like and to express how you're feeling. What message or theme do you want people to take away after reading your poetry that is on the walls of Central West and after like taking in the mural? Other people have said this before, and I really agree with this. Disability is everywhere and nowhere. So meaning that Disability really is everywhere. We're everywhere. The themes are everywhere. In your pop culture, anywhere in media, it's just like it's often erased or made invisible. Once you start knowing and like engaging with it, you'll never unknow it. And so that's kind of what I want people to take away. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your experiences and your work with us. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for joining us for this month's episode of All Access. I am your co-host, Christina McLean, along with guide dog Jade. And I am your other co-host, Lauren Huberman. Special thanks to our executive producer, Commissioner Rachel Arfa. As well as our special guests today, Sam Kirk and Lily Diego Johnson. We also want to recognize the City of Chicago's production team. Thank you for all your support as well as our ASL interpreter, Esteban Amaro. 